We'll get started. I'll open us up with prayer. And uh, this is our last session. Y'all have put up with me for six weeks. So this is our last session as we talk about God's gifting in our life and, and how we implement that and, and, and put that into practice. So let's pray and then we'll get into our study tonight. Father, we love you and I thank you for today and I thank you for each and every person here. And Lord, I pray blessings on them. Help us understand your word. Help us uh, be useful in your kingdom. Help us be kingdom-minded and kingdom-focused, uh, kingdom-driven uh, people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you open up your sheet of paper there, the first thing you have there is uh, they're supposed to do a group sharing time and all that, and it's, uh, but uh, we're going to just skip through that. Uh, but you may want to, where it says two worlds over there to the right, you may want to just uh, jot down some of the ones that you came up with. Allison and I talked this week and we worked on hers and uh, we talked about what I see as her spiritual gifts and how God's using her and, and all the, the different uh, hinge moments God has placed in her life and how God has kind of trained her and educated her and all that. So um, we came up with something real clever. I can't remember what it is, but uh, it was something about uh, <coughs> training thinkers or something like that is how we came up with, with Allison's uh, thing. So I pray that you do that. hope that you're doing that on your own as you think through what your, your purpose or what your calling and what your goal should be as we think about serving in God's kingdom. Uh, the first word with the ING, the training, that's kind of more your general. And then the last part should be a little more specific if that helps you. Okay. Uh, and we talked, I think Al Allison's uh, probably the smartest, one of the wisest people I know. I can say that now. She's not here, so I'm not, I'm not in trouble or anything. I'm not trying to make up for anything I did earlier today. But she really is one of the smartest people I know. We've been married for 23 years. I think I've won one argument. You know, I told her she should be an, a lawyer, right? She, she is very wise. She's very smart with her words. And she knows people real well. Uh, so uh, we talked about how God was using her and her job over at Northside and, and things like that. And that's what we came up with, with her, for her, all right? Uh, so I pray that you're doing that in, in your life, and as we get ready tonight, you might just jot down one or two. You should have at least those that ING thing memorized by now. You know, I'm here to help others and honor God by blank, ING, blank, okay? Allison was training thinkers, okay? Uh, and whatever yours is, you may want to jot down there at the top. And uh, just think about, what do you like about those, those words that you picked? And this is not a set in stone thing, okay? This should change and could change as you evaluate your life. And as I hope that you continue to think about these things, you would get this, your goal and your purpose a little more sharper the more you think about this and think about your life. Let's flip over the page 51 here and we'll get started, okay? So we began this story a long time ago with the illustration of an arrow, right? You see that on your paper there. The, the first thing we talked about was the arrow shaft. I've got too many sheets of paper here. Let me, I wrote, I wrote some notes on one sheet and wrote some other notes on another sheet, okay? Uh, the first thing we talked about was the arrow shaft. That, that's your story. If you remember that, that's how God puts different moments and people in your life to train and mold you into who he wants you to be and how God's story and your story kind of fit together there. Uh, the second thing we talked about was the arrow knock. That's the little piece, that, the little plastic piece that goes into the string, right? That's your gifting, okay? And that's what makes the arrow fly. That's where you get your power to be effective, okay? Uh, there are things that I have, I feel like I'm gifted at and other things that I'm not very gifted at, all right? Uh, but if I want to have some impact in the kingdom of God, I try to focus on the areas where I at least have some type of gifting, okay? Number three, we talked about the arrow fletching. That's your passion. That's what makes the thing fly straight. That is your why. We hear people talk about that all the time now. What's your why, okay? That's your passion, okay? That's what the thing that excites you, the thing that, that, that kind of motivates you when you think about kingdom work. The fourth thing we talked about was the arrowhead. That's what we talked about last night. That's the calling, okay? That enables you to accomplish your purpose, all right? And the last thing we want to talk about tonight is the target, all right? 
the intended point of impact of the arrow. That's your goal, right? So if you're filling in your blank there, goal, all right? So when I release an arrow, my goal is, if I release it, not bullseye, but just somewhere close, right? Paper plate close, that's what I call it, right? So if I can hit a paper plate at 20 yards, I can shoot a deer at 20 yards, okay? If I can hit a paper plate at 40 yards, I should be able to <coughs> kill a deer at 40 yards, right? So what's the goal here? And what I want to talk about tonight and, and what this whole session is kind of designed to do is to help you shoot your arrow. It's to help you shoot your arrow, all right? Now, let me give you a, a, an illustration. It's one thing to take a bow and arrow in the backyard and shoot it at a target. That target's not going anywhere, okay? I'm standing in the same place. The target's the same. There's nothing in between me and that target. It's just wide open over and over, practice, 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 right? It's a different thing if you've ever bow hunted before. It's a different thing to get in a tree stand and then try to shoot an animal, all right? Because now I'm starting to deal with a lot of variables. I'm up high in a tree. That, that animal's down lower, okay? Uh, I practice at home at 20 yards and 40 yards. Well, this one, this deer is at 27 yards. So how do I aim? Where do I aim, okay? This deer's moving left to right. Is this deer gonna be still, okay? So there, there's a lot of things and variables that kind of come into play here between practice and actually doing. And a lot of times it's like that when we think about our spiritual gifts too, okay? It's kind of easy to sit back and go, okay, this is my gift, this is what I think. But then when you get to putting this into practice, there's a lot of things that kind of get in the way and, and there's a lot of more variables and things like that. But what I want to do tonight is help you still shoot that arrow, okay? I wouldn't want to get in a deer stand and, and go, oh, this just isn't like practice. I can't do it, right? All my practice is designed to get me to be able to be successful in a deer stand, okay? So, all right, for us tonight, we've been doing practice, all right? And what I hope we do at the end of this thing is go, okay, now we've kind of been practicing for six weeks. Let me go shoot my arrow. That's my goal is to, is, is to let one rip here, okay? All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's go over the big thought, okay? Here's your big thought for tonight. Your goal focuses your calling toward one point of impact. One point of impact. Somebody told me a long time ago when I was shooting a gun or, or shooting whatever, I don't know if I learned this from my dad or maybe I watched some sniper movie as a kid, but aim small, what? Miss small. Aim small, miss small. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, when we played disc golf out here and when I was kind of learning, you know, uh, when Nolan was here, Nolan doesn't do anything halfway. Like, he's going to be the best at it. So when we started playing disc golf, Nolan was sending me these videos and, hey, you watch this person and all that. I was watching this video on how to putt because I could never, I could get my little Frisbee close to the basket, but, you know, everybody else was like, you know, Brother Josh, he'd throw his and it, ching, in there. You know, Nolan would throw his ching in the basket, and I'd throw mine, and off to the side it would go, all right? So I'm watching these putting videos, and one of the things a guy said is when, when you're aiming with your putter, all right, he says you aim for one link. You pick out one chain link, and that's what you're aiming for. So if you miss that link, you're still in the basket. But aim small, miss small. So your goal focuses your calling towards one point of impact, okay? This whole process here is designed to just get you started, all right? What we've been trying to get you to do for the last six weeks is aim at one chain link, okay? So you will aim small, miss small, all right? So your goal focuses your calling towards one point of impact in order to create exponential breakthrough in your life. Now, what do I mean by that? The breakthrough actually comes when you realize you can make a difference in this world, that you can have an impact in this world that you can change lives in the way that God has built you and gifted you and designed you, you can have an impact in people's lives in this world, all right? That's the breakthrough. That's what's most meaningful about this, is you don't just sit on the sideline and look at everybody else and go, man, they're, 
that guy's got all the spiritual gifts in the world. And look at this guy, just talented and using all his talents for God's glory. And here I am just sitting in the pew, okay? That's not what this is designed to do. What it's designed to do is get you to go, you know what, I can make a difference and this is how. All right? So I'll say the sentence one more time because I've been talking too long about it. But your goal focuses, focuses your calling towards one point of impact in order to create exponential breakthrough in your life. Now let's flip open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 through 16. And we've been looking at this. We started off with the story of David and Goliath in chapter 17. We worked through that. Now we're in chapter 18. And we started that last week. And we're going to finish it up with verses 5 through 16 tonight. And have some, hopefully a, a valuable lesson that we can learn from Saul here, not David. All right? It says, and David went out, in verse 5 of, of chapter 18, David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. So that Saul sent him over the men of war, and this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And as they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing, just like when I get home. Right? Every time I walk in the door, Allison and the girls are just singing and dancing because I'm back in the house. So they're singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and with songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. And notice the song that they're singing. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Now they're singing this to Saul, right? So naturally, this don't, this don't set well with King Saul. All right? Verse 8. So I was very angry at this saying and displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? All right. In, that, in other words, everybody loves David more than me now. The only thing he ain't got is a crown sitting on his head. And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. And as he did, day by day, Saul had a spear in his hand. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. That's a nice way of saying it. But David evaded him twice. It's like the ultimate game of dodgeball. All right? But Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And then Saul saw that he had great success, and he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. Notice one thing, if you can see a continuation from last week, that God is, is putting hinge moments, and he's putting David in places. He's setting him up. Okay, His, his goal, he's already been anointed king he's just not king yet but David's continually serving he's doing what he's supposed to do and God keeps putting David in just the right spot you see it over and over and over again all the way up until 2 Samuel chapter 2 where he actually becomes king all right now here's here's my question for you I want you guys to answer this why did Saul react in such a way why did he respond to David in this way there's no right answer. He was jealous. jealous. I got that one written down. Good one, Miss Karen. That was number two on my list. What else? Threatened. threatened. Felt threatened by David. What else? A fleshly response. That's a good one. I put he was insecure. That was my first one. Doesn't seem like Saul's too comfortable in his own skin here. What else? He might have been suspicious of David's motives. Suspicious, yep. I put down two others. I put down that Saul was more worried about his reputation at this point than God's reputation. 
And then I put down that Saul is more worried about his kingdom than he is God's kingdom. And I think that happens to us a lot of times when it comes to implementing our spiritual gifts. When it comes to us actually shooting the arrow, a lot of times we get more worried about our kingdom and our agendas over God's agenda. But by and large, whatever the motive is, jealousy, insecurity, suspicion, we all see in this that Saul really loses sight of his purpose and his gifting, right? Saul is supposed to be the king, but after chapter 17, 18, 19, all the way up until David becomes king, Saul really doesn't act very kingly. He's like totally forgotten about what God would have him do, and he's just worried about this, agenda, this vendetta with David. All right? So we see that over and over. All right? So keep your God-given sense of purpose. When I read this little section of Scripture, that's the main thing I pull out. It's very important that I keep my God-given sense of purpose and not lose that. Another thing that I see in here that I think is very important, when you, look, when you put David in this, in this mix, is when using our calling doesn't necessarily place us into a safety bubble. All right? It may make us uncomfortable. We may not know exactly what we're doing okay, when we get started. Okay? So when we talk about exercising the calling of God that he puts on our life, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be in a security blanket all the time. And I think that's okay. To me, it's better to shoot the arrow and miss the target than to not shoot the arrow at all, if that makes sense. Unless you shoot the arrow through your uh, shop and into your daughter's brand new Barbie Jeep. Not that I've ever done that, but I've heard of guys doing that before. There's nothing more fearful than watching an arrow go through one of those plastic Lowe's buildings into your shed. You go, I wonder what that hit. It hit your daughter's brand new Barbie Jeep. All right. So, uh, ask Allison about it. She was real happy I did that. And, uh, and everything. She was very pleased with me. All right. Let me give you another tip here. And I'm going to say it this way. Wars are won one battle at a time. So let's say you've never shot a bow and arrow. Okay. All right. Who's never shot one? All right. Have you shot one? I have took archery in college. Oh, did you get an A? I think so. Okay, okay. All right, let's suppose Miss Janie's never shot a bow and arrow. So I, we, I, she goes and buys one, and I, I'm giving her lessons, right? When you first start shooting one of these things, this is, you're not going to hit the bullseye every time. The goal is just to get close. The goal is to get your form down and to keep shooting. That's how you get good. You keep shooting over and over and over again, right? I think it's important to remember when we think about our calling here that the, the, the war is won one battle at a time. In other words, you keep using your gift, okay? Even if you don't do well the first time, you keep using your gift, all right? And I, ultimately, Saul took his eye off the target, right? If, if I'm sticking with my metaphor, all right? Saul took his eye off the target. So my question to you tonight is, is what are you shooting at? What are you aiming at? Okay, that's the big thing that I think we learn from this. Now, let's, put, let's get really practical here uh, and, and, and flip the page, and we're going to talk about this concept of a 90-day goal. All right? Now, they talked about this with us a lot, so your next page should be page 52, and it's going to have a big cross on it. Okay, so... They talk with us about the importance of 90 days and a lot of the things that we do. So 90 days is long enough for you to kind of set some goals, but it's also short enough where it should be attainable. Okay? So if I want to lose weight, I ain't, but if I really wanted to, okay, uh, I might set a 90-day goal, right? So in 90 days, I want to lose 9 pounds, or 10 pounds, okay? So it's close enough, you know, three months-ish, you know, where it's not something that's unattainable, 
But I also am setting a goal that I can watch for those 90 days, something that's achievable. All right. So in your little The Important Urgent Matrix on page 52, that, that's a weird name for this diagram, but it'll help you think through some things. On the bottom right-hand side, okay, I want you to start there. If you notice the way this thing is set up, it's quadrants of things that are highly important at the top and things that are not very important at the bottom. And things that are very urgent on the right side and things that are not very urgent on the left side. So I want you to start in the bottom right corner here, okay? Where it would be things that are <coughs> highly urgent but not important. Some things in your life that you got going on right now that you feel are like urgent but not necessarily important. I want you to write some of those things down. And it could be some spiritual things. And it could be like the most urgent thing I got to do when I get home is take the trash out. I'm already thinking about it. Bradley too. Noah has moved off. The first day Noah was gone to, to basic training, I called Bradley. I said, bro, Noah's gone. You got to take your own trash out. I take mine out and Gail's out. I ain't taking yours out too. You, you're going to have to take your trash out. All right. So what's urgent but not important? I got a long list of those. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to kind of think through those things. So after you're kind of done with that one, I want you to go catty corner to the top left. Now I want you to put in some things in there that are very important to you but that are not super urgent on your to-do list. I'll give you a couple of minutes there. Important but not urgent. That's where I would put lose 10 pounds. <laughs> Stuff like that. <laughs> this is your procrastination list. The things, the things in my life a lot of times that are important but are not very, that don't feel urgent, a lot of times if I'm honest are more spiritual things. Like I never get up in the morning, like when I get up in the morning I know having a quiet time is important. But I don't feel like, man I got to do it right now, I got to get it done now. Does that make sense? Here's the thing that, that they want you to think about. The, the things that go in the top right corner, the things that are very important and urgent, we all know to take care of those things first, right? We know, like, this has got to be done, it's important, and it's urgent, this has got to be done. Stuff like, hey, I gotta pay my light bill, it's due. I like electricity, all right? I need to pay that light bill. Okay, that's important and urgent, all right? But the battle comes in, and the, the place where we get confused in our life is, is, is in these categories of what's urgent and not important and what's important and not urgent. That's where all the confusion comes in, okay? In other words, I told you the, the deer hunting story earlier about the difference between practice and actually trying to shoot a deer with a bow. I told you that story because this is, that's kind of the illustration of what we're dealing with here, okay? Because what happens when it comes to exercising our spiritual gift and doing, by and large, any kind of kingdom work, okay, what tends to happen is the urgent comes in and takes over the, the important stuff, 
And we never get to what really matters because the urgent stuff. Okay? So let's go, let's use my diet illustration. I need to lose 10 pounds. That's important, but it's not urgent. Okay? But you know what? Uh, I'm really hungry right now. So before I go home and take out the trash, the most urgent thing I do is feed my body. And the quickest way I can do that is running to McDonald's over here. Does that make sense? So the urgent takes over the important in our lives. Okay? When you're in a deer stand and you're trying to shoot a deer, okay, it's not like, oh, he's standing 20 yards broadside just like I practice. It's no problem. It is, well, he's cat-cornered to me. He's, he's quartering away from me or he's quartering to me. He's at 23 yards and the thing's downhill. And I've got to watch and pick my spot because there's three trees coming. There's three trees in the way. So where am I going to shoot this arrow, right? And that's what happens in our life when it comes to us trying to do our spiritual gifts as we draw this arrow back and go, there's just too much stuff in the way right now, okay? I got to thin these branches out in my life. I got too much urgent stuff going on. And all the urgent, unimportant stuff keeps us from actually getting to what really matters. Does that make sense? All right. Now, in what you wrote down, in actuality, I want you to, to do some math here. I want you to write down two numbers and they have to equal 100. So if this was a scale, right? If you're, if you're, sex, if you're urgent but not important stuff and your important and not urgent stuff was a scale, how would you weigh those? Were they equal to 100? And I want you to write a number down and circle it. For instance, let me give you all a minute. Is that confusing? Is that clear? Okay. All right. On my urgent, not important stuff, I feel like that takes up about 70% of my stuff, my time, my energy. But the important, not urgent stuff takes up about 30. That equals 100. Okay? Yours may be different. I imagine they all differ depending on what stage of life we're in, our jobs. I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's a host of variables that, that would make this different. So I want you to write down what it actually is and circle those two numbers. And then I want you to think about the way you want it to be. You put those numbers in a square or whatever. And those need to equal 100 too. That maybe will tell you how much stuff you got in the way in your life. Does that make sense? So... If you've got, well, I spend 95% of my time doing urgent, not important stuff, and 5% of my time doing important stuff, but I really want it to be 50-50, that means I got a lot of stuff in my life I need to really look at and evaluate to see if this is as urgent as I think it is. All right? That's what that's designed to do. These are just tools to get you to think through exercising your spiritual gifts, okay? Now let's flip the page one more time. One more practical thing. Here's your 90-day goal funnel right here. All right. I want you to write down six goals for the next 90 days. Look, three of them need to be spiritual. Three of them can be whatever. But I want you to write down six goals. And this, this, these, this is the tip they gave us, which I think is really good. In the anacronym SMART, they want you to be smart about it, right? Be number one, specific. Okay, this is where it gets, don't, don't get of anything too broad, just general, okay? Like, be a better person, that's not it. Okay, that's too broad, all right? So number one, be specific. Number two, be measurable. Okay, if one of your goals is, uh, uh, in the next 90 days, I want to have a quiet time five days a week or whatever. Or I want, to, I want to pray for 30 minutes a day. I want to, you know, go to church, you know, three times a month, whatever it is. So be specific, number one, be measurable. Number two, it needs to be attainable. So for me... I'm not going to put, I want to lose 107 pounds in the next 90 days, all right? 
That ain't going to happen. Maybe if I chopped off both my legs and an arm. All right, so it needs to be specific, measurable, attainable. It needs to be relevant to your life. It doesn't need to be something obscure and, you know. And then you need time. You need, enough, you need to be able to, to accomplish this goal in this amount of time. That's your Kirby Smart rules of your 90-day goal. So write, write down your six goals. Six things you could achieve. I think one of those should be putting your spiritual gift into practice in some way. At least begin to think about that. Like in 90 days, like if I'm called to teach, what can I do in 90 days that would help me be able to teach? I could go talk to Brother Mike about where I could teach. I could go talk to Brother Bradley about this Bible book that I'm interested in teaching. Et cetera, et cetera. All right. And this is where it gets good. And these questions are down here for you, but we're going to, go, we're going to look at them real quick tonight. What goal would move me closer to living out my, my calling fully? We're trying to find just one out of the six, right? So what goal would move me closer to living out my special calling fully, right? So he's asking you to narrow down the six. He's trying to find, get you something that's more important. Number two, what might be a fitting next step from what God has been doing in my life to date? So in other words, what's my next step to do for accomplishing this goal? What's my next battle that I need to win? And this is where it comes into conflict. Is, is where's, what am I motivated to accomplish? Sometimes it's easier to be motivated to go, hey, I need to lose 10 pounds versus, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my quiet time every day for 90 days. Right? And we're back to the battle of urgent versus important. What goal have I listed that I would still be motivated to work on six weeks from now? And then lastly, what goal, if I accomplished it, would help me grow? All right. So I can get my next goal done. So tonight is really all about one thing. This, this whole time that we spent together tonight is really designed to get you to think about one thing, is, and that is... In my life, how does the rubber meet the road? How do I start putting this into practice? Okay, How do I start shooting my arrow? Right? We've been practicing. We've kind of been talking about the fundamentals of what it looks like to shoot an arrow. What do I need to do in my life to actually let one fly? To just draw back and let one go. Right? What do I need to set up in my life? What do I need to do? What are some steps that I need to take? I want you to, out of those six, and you may change your mind when you get home as you, because you're thinking about those questions, but I want you to start thinking about how to accomplish that goal. Right? So if your goal is to uh, teach, you've never taught anything before, but you feel like you might have that gifting, where can you teach? Who needs to be taught? What needs to be taught? Those are things you can ask yourself and then start working towards that. Okay? We got Thanksgiving lunch coming up next week. You may be thinking, I have the gift of hospitality. I've never helped Miss Janie serve on the hospitality committee. What goal? This is my new goal to be hospitable. All right? Well, you need to talk to Miss Janie. 
All right? And she can help you be hospitable here at, at Mount Gilead, okay, as we get ready for our Thanksgiving meal. Make sense? All right. Totally practical, totally pragmatic tonight. A little weird. I understand doing the, the important, not important thing is weird, and your little funnel is weird, but all these things are designed to help you think through what's preventing me in my life from doing what God wants me to do, and is this actually important? Okay, what do I need to rearrange in my life to make this a goal for me? All right, let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, I love you. Thank you so much for tonight. God, I totally understand the war that we face between busyness and things that are uh, urgent versus what's really important. So God, I pray you help us balance those things. In Jesus' name, amen.